children ask some of the strangest and simplest questions. They're also uh, very honest questions. Emma had uh, asked a variation of one question several times as she tries to understand her faith. Daddy, is Jesus real? Yes, of course he is, honey. But I don't see him. And sometimes I pray and I don't hear and it's hard to pray because I don't hear him. Simple and honest questions. Daddy, where's heaven? Can we see it? Can we go there? Simple, honest questions. Questions that we at times may struggle with or ponder as we reflect on our own faith. Simple and honest questions that deal with our strange hope as Christians. Today we're going to focus on the hope we have as Christians, a strange hope in the eyes of the world we live in, but nonetheless, uh, everything to us. We're going to begin uh, by seeing different aspects of our hope first off, and then we'll look at uh, our present experience of hope in the midst of difficult realities in life, and we'll conclude with a response. So we're going to start with what our hope is, we'll look at our uh, present experience of that hope, and then finish with our response to that hope. So let's begin then with the content of our hope itself, and we'll begin by just saying this and just admitting this, that we have strange hope. Uh, in the passage this morning, I think we find uh, four aspects of this strange hope, and there's at least four. There's probably more than that, but I'm going to focus on just four of them, and uh, we'll do that as we look through verses 3 to nine. And the first aspect of our strange hope is this. We have strange hope for resurrection, for resurrection. Now notice that the very first thing mentioned uh, is exactly this in verse three. In verse three, it starts out by saying, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And now what the text seems to be saying is, I think, two things here about the resurrection. First of all, the Lord is telling us through Peter that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the means through which we have been given uh, new birth and a living hope. So it's the resurrection that gives us hope. Uh, it's not just the cross, by the way, we've mentioned this before, it's not just the cross of Christ, uh, although it is essentially the cross of Christ. It's not just the cross, it's also the resurrection. We cannot talk about the gospel and stop at the cross. So we have to talk about the cross and the resurrection. If we stop short of the resurrection, we're stopping short of giving people the full hope of all that the gospel promises us. Uh, and, you know, in evangelism, this might be the stranger of the two things to talk about. When we're trying to talk about other people, uh, who Jesus is and what the gospel means, you know, we might think, well, it's already weird enough to talk about the cross, and now you've got to talk about the resurrection, too. I mean, people are going to think of zombies or something. Uh, but that is uh, an essential part of our hope, and so we shouldn't stop short there. So, first of all, it is the means, along with the cross, through which we have salvation. This is the Christian's hope. But it is also uh, the means of our, or not the means, sorry, it is also uh, the content, you might say, of what our hope is about. So the resurrection here of Jesus Christ is a resurrection from the dead. And the fact that it's, it adds, uh, the Lord adds this part to the text, uh, emphasizes the victory of the resurrection over death and the hope it promises to bring us uh, back from the dead, literally. Literally. Yes, that means to bring our physical bodies out of their graves. Uh, and yeah, that is incredible. In incredible and incredibly strange, right? The resurrection. I've shown you this before. Maybe some of you haven't seen it, but this is the grave of Jules Verne. And it's pretty cool, isn't it? It's also pretty weird. You don't see something like this uh, often at all. But uh, that is the gospel, uh, that's also, you know, what I want my grave to be to look like, and if only I was that ripped. But uh, that's the gospel message of the resurrection. 
It's very countercultural. It, even, it looks a bit strange from even what we're used to when we talk about death and dying and everything else, but this is the hope of the gospel. A hope that's not just spiritual, but physical. A hope that answers and overcomes all the problems we face because of the curse of sin. A hope which literally gives us life from the dead, spiritually and physically. We have a strange hope, and part of that strange hope is for resurrection, a physical, literal resurrection. The resurrection is also um, uh, the, the first focus that we have of our hope here, but it's not the only one. So the gospel, uh, the second aspect, sorry, of our hope here, we find in verse 4. Verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Uh, we have a strange hope for an eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance. For an eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance. Uh, here in the passage, the, the contrast Peter is making is with the perishable, spoiling, and fading inheritances of this world. The inheritance is that the believers of Asia Minor were no doubt tempted to become jealous and even greedy for, and we can be pretty certain that this is the main focus. Uh, as we look through just chapter 1, you look in verse 7 and verse 18, notice uh, that here in verse 7 our faith is compared uh, as, as something that is greater than gold which perishes. In verse 18, uh, we have been purchased with uh, not perishable things like silver and gold, right? We've been redeemed with things better than that. Again, contrasting those things of this world, the valuable things of this world. Then verse 23 to 24, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the, flower, the flowers fall. So here, just in the first chapter, we, Peter continues to contrast what we have in Christ, the faith we have in Christ, the inheritance we have in Christ, with uh, all the other uh, perishable things of this world, whether they be gold or silver or anything else. They all are perishable. They all fade away. The most valuable inheritances of this world all decay, all perish, all fade. No matter how glorious and wonderful they might be, nothing can compare with what is coming for us in Jesus Christ. But it's hard for us to imagine this kind of an inheritance because all that we know, uh, the best things that we know in this world all fade away, all perish, they all fall apart, they all break down. It's hard for us to imagine what uh, this kind of an inheritance might be like. Uh, and when a family member passes in this world, for example, the inheritance they leave to us normally means something like digging through a pile of old, dirty, dusty junk, right? That's the inheritance that we get in this world. Um, but not so with God. Jesus, who John 14 says is preparing a place for us personally, uh, the creator God of the universe, who speaks things into existence, is making something for you. I can't think of a better contractor I can't think of a better designer or gift giver that I'd want to have something from, and that is the one who is doing it for you. But, and still, we can't imagine that. But just try, try if you could, to imagine this world, this creation, without all of the bad things that we associate with it. Uh, imagine uh, a place that doesn't have scorching 100-degree heat all the time, Right? A place that makes Hawaii and the weather there just pale in comparison. A place where there's no such thing as poverty. There's no poverty. Po what's poverty? Poverty? Everybody has everything here. There's food aplenty, and, and everyone has a personal inheritance from Jesus Christ himself. Poverty? A place where there, there's no such thing as, as rotting food or food that has spoiled and, and gone horribly bad or, or, or food that just is a bad bunch. You know, every time we eat whatever we eat, it's always incredible because we're in heaven, duh. You know, it's just, it's incredible. Or imagine a place, something simple, a place without locks. I mean, we have locks on everything here. We have keys for all kinds of things, right? We carry them around and they weigh down our pockets. Uh, 
here in our church, uh, we have a fridge with locks on it. Fridge and a freezer with locks, right? We gotta lock away food. And we have had over the years, a couple times, okay? It doesn't happen all the time. We've had a couple times people raid our fridge or freezer and steal food from a church fridge, right? We've got locks everywhere here. But in, in eternity, locks, what are locks? Keys, who needs keys? It's hard for us to imagine, but our hope is for in eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance and for a resurrection. But our next hope, we see the third hope, is in verses 5 and 9. Verse 5 says, "...who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time." Verse 9, "...for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Our hope here is for complete salvation from sin, for complete salvation from sin. Now, the word salvation in these two verses that you see here, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean the salvation we receive immediately upon faith. Uh, immediately when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified before God's judgment. We are saved, and it is done forever, done. But it's not, you could say, it's not completed yet. We still live in a world uh, facing the effects of sin. We are all still going to die someday, and we all still are tempted and, and fight uh, an internal battle with sin in our lives. Uh, so the word salvation, the salvation that we're talking about here is when that salvation is complete, was perfected in eternity, and it won't happen until then. Um, but this could be taken a, a couple different ways. I think you could take this word salvation in kind of more a general way to mean everything we're saved from and everything that we receive in eternity, or it could be a little more specific than that, and I think it is. I think what it is talking about more specifically is what we are saved from, the sin we are saved from, the sin and the judgment of God that we're saved from in eternity. This is a strange thing to talk about. Um, it's strange nowadays for anyone to admit that there is such a thing as sin in the first place. Oh, sin, that's just an old religious term. You're just trying to guilt people into, you know, believing in God. And judgment, even worse. Who's going to talk about judgment? God judging people for what really isn't that big of a deal in the first place? You stuck up religious people, right? Sin and judgment? But this is our strange hope a hope that we must share with the world, especially because they suppress this truth and avoid it at all costs. And this means that at times we may have to say things that we wish we had more time to explain. We wish we had more time to explain. When I was uh, over at the coast before um, we had moved here. I worked at a restaurant. I worked at several restaurants as a server uh, in the past, and at this particular restaurant, I was just talking, talking uh, in the kitchen to the pastry chef, and just out of nowhere, we're in the middle of a little, just a short conversation in between taking plates to tables, and she asks me, so you believe homosexuality is a sin, don't you? As she hands me a plate to go take to a table. What am I going to say? I, I could just leave it there and say, well, let's talk about that more later. But I know in, the, in that moment, I know that's just, that's not going to happen. So I answer her. I say, yes. But, but, I don't believe I'm a sinner any more than anyone else is. I don't believe that anyone else needs salvation any more than I do. What the, the gospel message is all about, what Christians really believe, is that all of us need salvation. All of us, everybody has sinned and needs God to save us. And that's all I got out before she could just ask again, but you believe homosexuality is a sin, don't you? And I said yes. And then took the plate to the table. That's all I had time to answer, and that's frankly all she really wanted to hear me answer, just a yes or a no. But as Christians who have this strange hope that uh, above all other things, we want to communicate to people that they need and we need salvation that can only be found through the cross of Jesus Christ, we have to say it. 
We have to share our hope in it and not just be content to say yes or no, but to say as much as we are capable or able in the moment to say that yes, but you need salvation. Yes, but we need salvation and Jesus is more than willing to give it to every single one of us. Our strange hope is for resurrection. It's for an eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance, and it's for complete salvation from sin in a place where we will not even feel the compulsion for sin anymore. The fourth and the final hope we find, we find in verse seven, which says this. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The focus here is on the last phrase, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And I'm gonna summarize it this way with our fourth point, that uh, we have a strange hope for the heavenly honor of Jesus Christ, for the heavenly honor of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Now this phrase can go both ways. This can go both ways. Uh, This could either mean honor from Christ or honor to Christ. And it seems, you know, a bit ambiguous. Uh, So it could, first of all, mean from us to Christ, that we here are praising Christ in eternity. And this is the first reaction I had when reading this passage, and I think simply by the the term praise itself, that's something we reserve for God. However, there is another option. It could also mean, uh, or it could otherwise mean, from Jesus Christ to us. And I think this is, in fact, the the focus of the the meaning here, that because the focus is on the genuineness of our faith uh, that is proved by trials and that is in the context of the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning future judgment, uh, I think this is talking about Jesus Christ's recognition of our genuine faith. And this makes us feel strange to say that because, again, of this term praise. However, the same word uh, is used Uh, in other passages to more clearly speak of God uh, commending us or recognizing us for our faith. We see it in Romans 2.29, which says, A man is a Jew if he is one out inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. And this word praise is the same word used, uh, apinos in Greek, in uh, 1 Peter. We also see it in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, which says, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Again, praise, same word, apinus, used in Romans 2 and 1 Peter. Now, other translations translate Uh, praise in 1 Corinthians 4 differently, and it can mean these other things. Other translations use commendation from God, or recognition, just simple recognition from God. And this is, I think, the the better translation of this word in at least these three passages. In other words, uh, what this passage is talking about is that part of the Christian's hope is that one day, after a life of trial, after a life of being a stranger in this world, after a life of fighting and struggling with sin and Satan, after a life of wondering whether or not our service for Christ really mattered or was noticed, Jesus Christ will look upon us and say, there, man of faith, there he is, there she is, a woman of faith. And it won't be because we have done some great feats or in any way earned Jesus' praise, quite the contrary, It will be a further extension of his grace toward us who have simply placed our faith in his work, in his great work, in the cross and the resurrection. That simple faith is more valuable to him than gold, than the most precious things of this world, our faith. Now, there may be a great many other things that we would like to be recognized for. We we would like to be recognized now and, and in eternity, perhaps for being great fathers and mothers. Uh, for being great grandfathers or grandmothers, being great husbands or wives, being great businessmen and women, being great workers, great students, great leaders, great artists, even being great Christians. But that's not the focus here. It's not the focus, and that's not the primary focus that Christ will have of us. What is most valuable to Jesus and ought to be to us is whether or not we are people of simple faith in Christ's work for us. 
None of those other things can compare to that. Whether we're recognized for them or not, none of those other things uh, can come close to the cross. None of those other accomplishments come close to the resurrection. None of those other accomplishments come close to forgiveness for sin, to complete satisfaction of God's wrath, to eternal life beyond the grave, to adoption as sons and daughters of God, our Heavenly Father, to the indwelling, life-giving Holy Spirit. This is a strange hope to be sure. No one else but Christians hope to be recognized simply for faith, for just a mustard seed of faith, trusting, believing that what Christ said is true, that the cross is what we need, that the resurrection is what we need. Everyone else wants to be recognized, and we admit, too, that we would like to be recognized for all those other things. But the problem with all those other things, apart from the fact that they are nowhere near as great as the cross and resurrection, is that none of those other things can make up for the times when we were not great fathers or mothers. None of those other things can make up for the times when we were not great grandparents, when we were not great husbands or wives, when we were not great businessmen or women, when we were not great workers, when we were not great students, when we were not great leaders or great artists or even great Christians. Faith and faith alone in Christ's great work alone. Faith is the primary thing we'll be commended for and we ought to want to be recognized for as Christ because he is has done it on our behalf. Our strange hope is for resurrection. It is for an eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance. It is for complete salvation from sin. It is for the heavenly honor of Jesus Christ. This is a strange hope, but no other hope can compare. Uh, There's just one problem, though, with all of this, and it's a problem with the nature of hope itself. We have to wait we have to wait for it. And while we're waiting, we do so in a world that thinks our hope is strange and a world where trials are normal. So let's continue by turning our attention to how the Lord addresses our normal trials in the text. And I think here there are two teachings in verses 3 through 9 uh, about our trials that, that we're going to focus on anyway this morning. And the first deals with the normal reality of trials, and the second with our ex- normal experience in trials. So let's look again uh, at verses 6 to 7. Which say this, In this, meaning your hope, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by a fire, may be found genuine. The first point to make here is that trials are normal and numerous in this lifetime. Trials are normal and numerous in this lifetime. Now, we can first of all uh, see in the text that trials are normal. Uh, they, They are God's normal process, in other words, for proving our faith. So the same way a goldsmith, for example, uh, refines fire, refines gold with fire, uh, the Lord also has a normal way he refines and proves our faith, and that is through trials. And it's not just that they're normal, it's that there's also all kinds of them, all kinds of trials. They're numerous. Oh, wouldn't we love for there to just be one kind of trial, you know, just one section of our life that we could put aside and say, all right, there's the trial part of our life and everything else can avoid that. Or how we would love if there was just one trial. There's like some kind of stepping stone thing in our life where you reach a certain age, you go through a certain trial, and then it's done, and all right, whew, done with that, right? Uh, But not the case, not the case. Now, this is not to say that trials are happening in our life every moment without end. And and in the text right here, uh, Peter points out that the trials they were experiencing and are experiencing were just for a little while. Nevertheless, it it is very important for us to recognize that trials are indeed normal and numerous for Christians. Uh, This is why you should run away from health, wealth, and prosperity preachers. Anyone who tells you or tries to tell you that the normal Christian life does not include trials, that trials are not a normal uh, and numerous part of God's plan for your life, are flat wrong. 
Whether they know it or not, they are not telling you the truth. They are lying. So let me try to give you an illustration of this and why this is true, okay? It's a little like a, a marriage counselor. It's a little like a marriage counselor telling an engaged couple that marriage is nothing but romance, hugs, and kisses all life long and, and uh, smells like roses all the time. Uh, the engaged couple, they might buy it. After all, that's what's, you know, being put out there in a lot of movies and TV all the time. But if that same marriage counselor tries to tell a married couple of 30 years the same thing, what will they do? They'll laugh at him, right? If they're kind, they'll say, oh, <laughs> thank you for your advice, but you just don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. Marriage, like the Christian life, can be and often is romantic uh, and, and has lots of hugs and kisses. Right, Laura? <laughs> she laughed. <laughs> I knew it. Uh, but marriage is also two different people and two different sinful people put in a home together and told to share everything. Right? Any experience we have with little children will teach us that that is a recipe for disaster, right? But marriage also, like the Christian life, is full of its own unique trials that should make each person in the marriage a more selfless, a more loving, and a more mature person. And in fact, God has made it that way so that we would grow up through our marriages and through our Christian lives. I would not be the man I am today if it were not for my wife. And before you laugh at that, just think of the kind of person I must have been before I married her, okay? Trials are normal and numerous in this lifetime. So how then do we interact with our trials? So what's our experience of them now? Uh, what should it be? Well, um, that's our second point here, and that is this, that it's normal to feel grief because of our trials and yet remain joyful because of our hope. It's normal to feel grief because of our trials and yet remain joyful because of our hope. Let's look again at the text, and this time verses 6 and verse 8. Uh, verse 6 and verse 8. In this you greatly rejoice, again, your hope, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Notice in the text here that there is a mixture of both grief and joy. And these two things are happening at the same time, and this is normal. It's normal for example, to feel grief in trials. There's no negative judgment here. It's just a statement of fact. Trials cause grief. And the kind of trials specifically that are being talked about here in the passage are uh, most likely related to persecution for our faith, for their faith. And so we as Christians, we don't need to pretend to be happy when we go through these kinds of trials, uh, when uh, are, we're persecuted simply for believing the teachings of Scripture, when uh, we are uh, seeing the name of Christ ridiculed, or when we've become the crazy Christian outsider in our family, right? Show of hands. I'm one of those people, right? Um, we feel grief, and that's normal. Uh, but I think this also goes for the normal trials of life, when our plans don't work out like the way we hoped they would, uh, when our children test our wonderful Christian character, uh, when we lose a, a loved one in our life. These trials cause us grief, and this is normal. Um, and as a church, this is something that we are meant to do in our trials is to let the grief be there, to help each other through our trials, to pick each other up as we walk through them together, not putting on fake painted smiles, pretending as if the Christian life means everything is okay all the time, right? Aren't you a wonderful Christian? Aren't you always happy? Trials cause grief. And yet, through the worst kinds of trials we experience, we can still greatly rejoice and be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. 
This is because there is a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based mostly on our circumstance, and joy is so much deeper. Joy is something we can always cling to and experience regardless of our life circumstances because it's rooted in our certain and sure hope. Even though we have not seen Jesus, even though we don't see him now, even though we are still waiting to see all of our hopes finally fulfilled, we trust the Lord at his word and we look ahead with great hope to those incredible things that are ahead for us no matter what the experience is right now. We trust and know that no matter the trial, no matter the the level of grief it causes, the end result is glory. The end result is resurrection. The end result is eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance. The end result is complete salvation from sin. The end result is the heavenly honor of Jesus Christ. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I will go through, and no matter the normal and many trials that are certainly coming ahead in my life. These things won't change. These things will happen. These things can fill me with joy that is inexpressible. Trials are normal, and they are numerous in this lifetime, and it's normal for us to feel grief and at the same time remain joyful through our trials and because of our hope. And that is exactly what the text is encouraging us to do and what I want to leave you with this morning, namely, to rejoice in your strange hope with faith in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in your strange hope with faith in Jesus Christ. Allow me to break this apart into two main points. First, rejoice. Rejoice in your strange hope. We see this uh, throughout the passage, and we really see this throughout the entire letter of 1 Peter, of, of all the purposes of the letter, uh, Peter writing to a people who are suffering persecution uh, certainly wants to encourage them to rejoice, to to think on what is coming for them. And and we see that in several passages. In verse 3, it begins with a declaration of praise to God our Father, uh, God the and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the beginning of verse 6, Peter describes the believers as greatly rejoicing in their Christian hope. Uh, In verse 7, which is no doubt going to be an incredibly joyful experience uh, as our faith results in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. And then in verse 8, that we're described uh, as people who, even though we don't see him, we believe and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. There, There will always be reason enough for us to be discouraged and to suffer grief in this lifetime. Always. You can count on it. Uh, And if we're looking for it, we'll always find it. And we ought to expect it as normal, in fact. But since we're expecting it, let's also take every opportunity to remind ourselves of the great hopes we have in Christ so that we can meet every trial with joy. To talk about what it will be like to be gloriously resurrected, even as we go through the pains and difficulties that this body suffers through in this lifetime, the illnesses and sicknesses and diseases. To talk about what our eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance will be like, even as the inheritances we have around us, the ones uh, that we maybe hope for and don't get, or the ones that we do and they fall apart, uh, do so to think about what's ahead to talk about how freeing it will be to finally have complete salvation from every experience of sin, to live uh, in a way where uh, sin and its temptation just do nothing for us, uh, where we live in a perfect relationship with God, with love for him and love for each other uh, that has no hindrance. To talk about what it will be like to experience the heavenly honor of Jesus Christ, to see him and have him see you and say, Welcome, man of faith. (laughs) Welcome, woman of faith. Welcome home. All of these things will sound strange, maybe even to other Christians, maybe even to ourselves. But how desperately do we need to remember, to remember your hope, to remember your hope, you strange Christians. Rejoice, in your strange hope. Second, 
Trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ as the sole basis for your strange hope. Trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ as the sole basis for your strange hope. This is also one that we see throughout the passage, uh, it repeated even more so than rejoicing. Uh, in verse 3, we see that it is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the work that he accomplished, that we can have hope. In verse 5, it's through faith in that resurrection and work of Christ and that we are shielded by God's power for that salvation which is coming. In verse 7, we see that it is our faith which is tested and that will be proved genuine before Christ and result in complete salvation. It's verse 8 that talks about us believing, continuing to have faith in him which brings us joy. And verse 9, uh, that you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls, not the goal of your works, not the goal of your accomplishments, not the goal of anything else but your simple faith in Jesus Christ that gives salvation and that Jesus will commend. Uh, recently, uh, just this week, in fact, I was meeting with um, Darlene Steele and her husband, um, Keith Steele, uh, over the last several months, had a stroke, and is just not himself anymore. It is really hardly able to communicate much at all. Uh, he, he's still very much alert and awake. He can respond to simple questions, but is just not himself. And that made Darlene ask this question to me. Um, Pastor, what do we do when people we knew our whole life were such strong people of faith then seemingly become somebody totally different? whether it's because of dementia or Alzheimer's or people that she could hear in the nursing home at times shouting and yelling and getting violent. What do we do about those people? And I was able to say, oh, Darlene, we don't trust in our strength or level of faith as the reason why we are saved. I don't know and I don't trust that I won't be a crazy person when I am 80 years old you know, crazier than I already am. I don't know that I'll remember my own name. But I'm not trusting in my strength of faith to save me. I am trusting in Jesus Christ's work to save me. That at any point in my life, if I have trusted in Christ, it is done because it's been accomplished already on the cross on my behalf. So that when I reach the end of my life, uh, whether I know it or not, Jesus Christ will save me. And my wife or anyone else can have confidence that he is, I am in his hands and always have been and always will be. And the moment I was able to share that with Darlene, her face just lit up and she said, yes, you're right, that is right. And that gives me such relief. If my faith is simply in my own faith, if I'm trusting in how strong of a faith I have or, or what level it might be at, then all my life long I am going to be doubting my faith and wondering if I'm really saved. But what Jesus calls on us is to have even just a mustard seed of faith, just, just a little bit of faith, because it's not about uh, the level of our faith. It's about the completed work of Christ in whom we have placed our faith. He saves us. And so we have confidence in him. And that is what we have before us this morning. On this table that we center around every month, we center around the work of Christ completed on the cross and freely given to us through faith. We're not here celebrating any person, any Christian's uh, incredible works of faithfulness in life. We're, we're not here celebrating any kind of story that we all have to reach or some level we have to surpass. We are here simply celebrating and remembering the crucified and risen Christ who saves us. Let's review this morning. We have a strange hope, a strange hope for resurrection, for an eternal, incorruptible, heavenly inheritance, for complete salvation from sin, for the heavenly honor of Jesus Christ. And while we live through this life, we experience normal trials, trials that are normal and numerous in this lifetime, and trials that cause us grief and yet 
we can still have incredible, inexpressible joy through because of this incredible hope we have. And so, as Christians, what we are called to do is to rejoice, to rejoice in our hope, even if it's strange, and to trust solely in the finished work of Jesus Christ as the sole basis for any of us having this hope.